In this video, we'll survey 4th century Christian interpretation of Daniel's 70 weeks. Reminder, hit the subscribe button below and turn on the notification bell to stay up to date as new videos come out. And if you're interested in supporting this ministry, just go to JustScripture.org and click on the support page. So far in our 70 week study, we've covered verse 24 that's provided the scope of the prophecy in its length and purpose. But before diving into the final three verses, is that we shifted to conduct a broad survey on early interpretations of the prophecy starting with the early Christian views. There, we saw that there was far from agreement on how to interpret the prophecy coming from the 2nd and 3rd century AD authors. The only consensus was that the weeks should be understood as literal years. Africanus and Origen did divert off from the others with the 354 day year and weeks of decades respectively view, but nobody took the weeks symbolically or said that they could represent indefinite periods of time. In regards to all the other main points in the prophecy is that we saw a lot of cheating of the text and of history on the part of the authors to prove their view, and very often remain conveniently silent on major points that would have undermined their position. So let's move forward into the 4th century AD and see how these Christian authors interpreted the prophecy. First up, Eusebius of Caesarea. He is mainly known as the first Christian historian, but for our purposes here is that we'll be primarily pulling from his proof of the gospel work in Book 8, Chapter 2. Eusebius starts off stating or citing verses 24 through 27. You can see here that there is nothing too significant in this version that he is using. And looking at verse 25 is that it looks pretty clean too. He says Christ the Prince for the Mashiach Nagid, but we won't make anything of that until he covers it himself. Now his verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, the anointing shall be destroyed, and there is no judgment in him. And he shall destroy the city and the sanctuary together with the coming prince. They shall be cut off in a flood, and to the end of the war, which is rapidly completed, in desolations. Now I'm sure an eyebrow went up with this one. Comparatively, you can already see some deviation on the part of Eusebius or the version that he is using here. The city and temple destruction reads in Eusebius' version as though there are two characters that together do the destruction and add that they shall be cut off in a flood, alluding to their death potentially. Needless to say, you can suspect Eusebius has an entirely unique scheme of his own working here. His verse 27 now. And one week shall establish the covenant with many. And in the midst of the week, my sacrifice and drink offering shall be taken away. And on the temple shall be an abomination of desolations. And at the end of time shall an end be, be put to the desolation. Again, you can see some subtle changes in Eusebius's version that reorients one's thinking of who is doing what in these specific verses. The he character is completely gone in his verse 27. So just expect the unexpected as he now attempts to prove his view. So he says the following. It is quite clear that 7 times 70 weeks reckons in years amounts to 490. That was therefore the period determined for Daniel's people, which limited the total length of the Jewish nation's existence. And he no longer calls them here God's people, but Daniel's, saying, Thy people. Him saying that the prophecy limited the length of the Jewish nation's existence probably already has you thinking about the 70 AD destruction. But let's let him keep explaining himself. 
So then, he first defines the length of time determined for the people, and then for the city. And it seemed to be the period from the restoration of Jerusalem, which was in the reign of Darius, king of Persia, until the reign of Augustus, emperor of Rome, and of Herod the foreign king of the Jews, in whose times our Savior's birth is recorded, as the prophecy goes on to show, and he adds next. So, Eusebius is start, starting his system in Darius the Great's reign and is saying that Emperor Augustus and Herod the Great are part of the prophecy. So, we already do have a new view in our hands here. He goes on stating that Jesus was anointed as the most holy and references the high priest being anointed with the holy anointing oil, but in regards to the Kadesh Kadesh, he admits the following. But as I find nowhere in the Holy Scriptures the high priest called most holy, I am of the opinion that in this passage only the only begotten word of God is meant who is properly and truly worthy of that name. So, he knows there are no references to the high priest ever being called most holy, which means that he would not agree with the translation of the NASB and others that have Aaron being referred to this way, leaving all of the examples in the Old Testament to be referring to the temple and its worship objects. He continues, or sorry, he continues saying that the 70 weeks were completed during Jesus' time and even acknowledges Africanus' work on the subject and then goes on saying, and if I make, if I may make an apposite comment myself on the passage, I would say that the prophecy does not make the division of the 70 weeks without an object or haphazard. For having divided them into the first seven and another 62, it adds the last one after a quantity of intermediate matter and thus determines the number of 70 weeks. So, Eusebius explicitly says that there is a gap of time between the end of the 69th week and the start of the 70th week, but their sum is still 70, and that makes it a legitimate stance. And now he begins attaching his scheme to historical events. He says, and the weeks of years makes 483 years added together from the reign of Cyrus up to the Roman Empire, when Pompeius the Roman general attacked Jerusalem and took the city by siege. Now, from this, you see that Eusebius was working with weeks of years and places the first 69 weeks between Cyrus and General Pompey's siege of Jerusalem. Pompey's siege of Jerusalem ended in 63 BC that ended Judah's small period of independence that led to the decline of the Hasmonean dynasty that gave way to the Herodian dynasty with Herod the Great's dad Antipater taking control in 47 BC. That painting there is portraying Pompey and his army entering the Holy of Holies in the temple. The notable fact there is that it did desecrate the temple, but he, Pompey, ordered it to be ritually cleaned immediately so the temple priests could resume their normal function like a day or two after. So this shouldn't be ever claimed as the abomination of desolation in Daniel. Now adding the 483 years onto 63 BC is that you get 4, 446, or excuse me, 546 BC, which technically does fall within the reign of Cyrus over Persia but still seven years before the fall of Babylon in 539 BC. But before we add more on to this view, is that you might have caught that Eusebius switched off from his earlier statement about the 70 weeks, starting with Darius the Great to the time of where Augustus and Herod were both ruling together. Which means that Eusebius proposed two systems within the same chapter. And he confirms this after you read ahead through, sorry, <laughs> all of the, his explanation for Cyrus to Pompey's siege of Jerusalem in 63 BC and very little about Herod the Great and in the Hasmonean line completely. 
The comical thing here is that he reiterates his Cyrus to Pompey system right before saying that you can reckon another way from Darius and the completion of the temple to Augustus and Herod. So his second system would look like this now. What's interesting with this system of his is that he syncs the 66th Olympiad with the second year of Darius, which makes it 512 BC in his view, as 776 is held as the starting point of the ancient Olympics. And this is where Eusebius says something really odd. He remarks how 121 Olympiads from Darius' second year is 484 years. That is Augustus's 15th year, and that this year is the year that Jesus was born on as it landed at the end of the 69 weeks. But adding 484 to 512 is that it lands you on 28 BC for Jesus' birth at the same time of Augustus' soul reign over the empire. Now, you might think, okay, but maybe Eusebius just didn't know his Olympiads that well or something. Uh, no. Remember, he is known most for being a historian and knew his Olympiads really well because in his Chronicon is that he sinks Tiberius' 15th year with the beginning of Jesus' ministry in the fourth year of the 201st Olympiad that is a 15-year Olympiad resulting in nearly a 60-year span between these two, which doesn't fly because the 15th year of Tiberius pulled from Luke 3, 1 and 23 states that Jesus was about 30 at the time and simply rewinding the clock from here puts you around 3 or 2 BC for Jesus' birth. And what makes me really speculate that he knew what he was doing here in a 70 week scheme is that he states that there were 548 years from Darius' second year to the 15th year of Tiberius which is extremely accurate according to, or reconciling this with modern chronology and dates the 70 AD destruction correctly with it being 42 years later from the 15th year of Tiberius so he does know his history pretty well but what really tips me off here is that in Jerome's Chronicon, where he translated Eusebius' work into Latin, is that he said Eusebius dated Jesus' birth in the third year of the 194th Olympiad, which is a 29-year difference that puts his birth back into a more normal year of 2 BC, not 28 BC. So, you have him promoting two possible schemes that are both filled with historical errors, even by his own accounts, which only leaves us now with trying to figure out where he blotted the 70th week in his scheme. He says, and afterwards comes the one remaining week, separated from them and divided by a long interval, during which occurred all the other events that are predicted in between all of which being foretold in the middle of the oracle were fulfilled. So, he reiterates that there is a gap between the 69th and 70th week, and that the events in the gap are spelled out in the middle of the oracle that refers to verse 26. What we can note here is that Eusebius did not see the Mashiach in verse 26 predicting the Messiah or Jesus' death, but to the cutting off of the legitimate high priesthood line and their role of anointing that was he was possibly alluding to earlier by saying that Herod the Great took out John Hyrcanus II that ended the order of the Mosaic high priesthood in 40 BC. But that would then come before the end of his 69th week system. Regardless, he says that 926 gap of events was fulfilled during the time where Augustus and Herod were ruling simultaneously and the destruction of the city and temple were metaphorically destroyed because it simply did not happen during their time, especially since we know that Herod was known for his building projects, including the huge expansion of the second temple. 
So Eusebius finishes his system saying, one week of years, therefore, would be represented by the whole period of his association with the apostles, both the time before his passage, passion and the time after his resurrection. So, he is saying that the 70th week is about Jesus with his crucifixion and the resurrection occurring in the middle of the week. How did he get or reconcile the three and a half years after the cross? He doesn't explain that portion, which then, you know, you and I can only assume that he concludes it this way in order to make sure Jesus was in the prophecy somewhere, thus keeping the prophecy messianic in his view. So, here's what Eusebius' 70-week systems finally look like. Now, before moving on from Eusebius, I think it's always beneficial for us to see what other views that these early writers had on Daniel, namely in chapters 2 and 7, with the four empires, because modern-day writers tend to only note points of agreement with them from their viewpoints. So it's good to know the full picture of these ancient writers before someone portrays it in a certain way. Eusebius connected Jesus with the divine son of man figure from Daniel 7.13 and flat out calls him God along with other key titles that we've discussed before in our study in videos that connected descriptions together of the second Yahweh figure that appears throughout the Old Testament who becomes incarnate in the New Testament. Eusebius continues to explain that there are two comings of Christ and that the second coming is described in Daniel by referencing Daniel 7 verses 9 and 13 and 14. Thus, he would see these prophecies unfulfilled. What's interesting is that before his 70 weeks discussion is that he talks about why the Old Testament prophecies didn't name the Romans directly. He says it was because they would be the empire under which the gospel would be proclaimed and it prevented offense from being taken, most notably in the visions of Daniel. This can only be referring to the fourth empire of Daniel 2 and 7 as described in the 15th book of the proof of the gospel of his and where only a fag frag <laughs> fragment has been found and translated back in 1825 but, thankfully, it is his interpretation of the statute and the four beasts and lists them as the Assyrians, Persians, Greeks, and Romans. Just note here that he was not skipping over the Babylonians. He was just referring to them and Nebuchadnezzar as Assyrian. And also that the four beasts run parallel with the statue as well. How did he see the final play out uh, with the ten toes and the eleventh little horn at the end? Can't say, as this ends what we have available to us. But still, Eusebius would see this as a future event at Christ's second coming. Well, that makes eight for eight, or nine for nine, for different systems in the church so far. Next up, Apollinarius of Laodicea. We only have what Jerome cited in his commentary on Daniel. Jerome said, On the other hand, Apollinarius of Laodicea, in his invest investigation of the problem, breaks away from the stream of the past and directs his longing desires towards the future, which very unsafely venturing an opinion concerning matters so obscure. So, we already know that we have another unique system on our hands here. And if by chance any of those of future generations should not see their predictions of his fulfilled at the time he set, then they should be forced to seek for some other solution and to convict the teacher himself of erroneous interpretation. So this already tells us that Apollinaris' system goes past 400 AD in the time of Jerome and Jerome advises his readers that those living in the days that uh, Apollinarius predicts that the 70 weeks will conclude is that if the events don't happen as he predicts they should, then the reader should drop Apollinarius and his views altogether. And this is the same advice we should give 
should be giving to the groups whose views stem off of the Millerite movement from the mid-19th century. Jerome continues on. And so, in order to avoid the appearance of slandering a man as having made a statement he never made, he makes the following assertion, and I translate him word for word. To the period of 490 years, the wicked deeds are to be confined, as well as all the crimes which shall ensue from those deeds. So, we know that Apollinarius took the weeks of years interpretation. He continues on. After these shall come the times of blessing, and the world is to be reconciled unto God at the advent of Christ his Son. So, he is saying that the 70 weeks conclude at the second advent of Christ and the ushering in of God's kingdom. He goes on. For from the coming forth of the word, when Christ was born of the Virgin Mary, to the 49th year, that is, the end of the seven weeks, God waited for Israel to repent. Thereafter, indeed, from the eighth year of Claudius Caesar onward, the Romans took up arms against the Jews. So, we know that his starting point is with Jesus' birth and that the first seven weeks ended in the eighth year of Claudius. With this as the starting point, Apollinarius is predicting Jesus' re return around 490 AD, only a hundred years or so from his present time. The interesting remark about Claudius' eighth year is that the two references to him in Acts are one with Luke saying that a prophesied famine occurred during Claudius' time. The Jerusalem famine is also mentioned by Josephus occurring after Agrippa's, the, Agrippa I's death. He is the, his brother, sorry, his brother Herod ruled from 44 to 48 AD, whose end point is the eighth year of Claudius. And on the other reference in Acts 18.2, speaks of Claudius' expulsion of Jews from Rome. What's interesting there is that Luke says Paul remained in Corinth for a year and a half after the conversion of Priscilla and Aquila. 18.12 starts the story where Paul is tried under Gallio, who by modern historians is dated ruling, from Achaia, ruling in Achaia from 51 to 52 A.D., but ancient historian Paulus, Paulus Orosius dated his reign from 49 to 50 AD. And subtracting back from this is that you could land on the eighth year of Claudius for the expulsion of the Jews from Rome. It's speculative, but possible. It's not me defending Paulinarius' system here at all, but we can just see his possible thinking that's going on. He continues on. But when 434 years shall have elapsed after that date, that is to say, the 62 weeks, then Jerusalem and the temple shall be rebuilt during three and a half years within the final week. So, he blows through the 62 week period saying nothing notable happens, but the 70th week's first half will be Jerusalem and the temple's reconstruction. Another historical reference here for us is that contemporary emperor to Apollinarius was a Julian the Apostate, who actually ordered for the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple. He hated Christianity so much, Julian that is, and wanted to see Rome get back to its pagan roots, that he felt that rebuilding the Jewish temple would help undermine Christianity's rise. Now back to Apollinarius. We can add these two points to his system now that lets us know that he saw the 70 weeks as continuous without any gap involved. That means that he was predicting the reconstruction to begin in roughly 482, which is why Jerome said that if this doesn't come to pass, then those future generations should, tall up, should toss Apollinaris' view in the trash. Completing his 70th week view, is that he said that Elijah would return, return would take place. This is drawing upon Malachi 4, 5 through 6, where God says he will send Elijah prior to the day of the Lord judgment period. 
Then Apollinarius says that the Antichrist will come and sit in the newly constructed temple by referencing 2 Thessalonians 2.4 and that he will wage war against the saints that will eventually lead to him being slain by Christ at his second coming. This war is constituted by what appears to be a loyalty pledge that people will have to make to either God or to the Antichrist. And you can see the abomination of desolation talk that is to occur in the midst of the week as well here. Apollinarius goes a little anti-Semitic for a moment by saying that the Jewish people are going to embrace the Antichrist and receive their final condemnation for rejecting Christ during his first coming. This likely means that he sees the Antichrist figure masquerading as the Jewish Messiah that is the hook to roping in a lot of Jewish people into this. So, Apollinarius' system is thus completed. But, a question you might have been wondering is, why would he advocate for such a position that avoided so much in the prophecy and goes against everyone else's starting point occurring sometime during the Persian period? Well, Jerome says that Apollinarius was pulling from Africanus' chronology and that it proved that the 70th week finishes out at the end of the world, or we could say today, the present age. Now, remember that Africanus held that there was 5,500 years to the birth of Christ. So, Apollinarius likely got the creation week of history model going on in his head from this, yet... Africanus saw the 70 weeks fulfilled with Christ using only lunar days for the reckoning. So, Apollinarius has more in common with Hippolytus by seeing the Antichrist re-establishing the kingdom of Judah and at this year 6,000 from creation would usher in the seventh day Sabbath rest for a thousand years. This resulted with Hippolytus planning the nativity around 5,500 and predicting the final week around 500 AD that would end the present age. Jerome said that Apollinarius rejected the possibility of there being a gap in the weeks and that they must remain continuous or join together. What this tells us is that Apollinarius started with the end of the world mindset having to occur at this year 6000 from creation. We need to pause here for a second and just ask, is this eisegesis or exegesis? Eisegesis would be the answer. So, Apollinarius is starting with his presuppositional belief, then tries to fit in the Bible by reversing out from this point, starting with the 70th week, then the first 69 weeks rewind back to the nativity in his view, that would only be a decade difference from Africanus' reckoning. So, Apollinarius basically avoided all the events that are described in verses 25 and 26 because he wouldn't allow for a gap and that the 70th week had to coincide with his end-of-the-world belief. 10 for 10. But what's important for us there was to see someone putting their presuppositional beliefs ahead of the Bible. Apollinarius' belief on the end times dictated his 70 weeks interpretation that obviously did not stick to the text at all. So just let that be a lesson to all of us out there. Next up, Athanasius of Alexandria. He should be known by most Christians today for the Athanasian Creed. He was exiled five times by Roman emperors, including Constantine. I bring that up because the common notion that the empire became Trinitarian Christian overnight thanks to Constantine at Nicaea is really bogus history when you dive into it. Athanasius fought hard against the spread of Arianism, who were Unitarians in that they believed that Jesus was a created being. Very similar to beliefs to that of the Jehovah Witnesses today. He wrote quite a bit, but... What many likely have heard is that he is the one who canonized the New Testament. However, all that his annual festal letter was, was simply a list of what books he and many others in the, in the church viewed as inspired. 
He wasn't the guy who banned 3 AD Gnostic works and all the other garbage that gets portrayed on TV or written in conspiracy books. Here's what he actually wrote. The heretics have fabricated books which they call books of tables, in which they show stars to which they give the names of the saints. The names of the saints is very likely referring to the Gnostic works that have the apostles and other New Testament figures names in them. Probably the most famous one is the Gospel of Thomas, namely because of the Da Vinci Code. The discovery of the Nagamani Library in 1945 is the main source of the extant manuscripts that we have today. Athanasius calls these books apocryphal and that the heretics tr try to trick the people by mixing them up with scripture as to make them appear on the same level. The key difference between them and the New Testament is that the 27 accepted books actually came from the eyewitnesses themselves. So, Athanasius wants to clear things up by clearly defining what books are divine by first listing the 22 Old Testament books that mirrors the same layout as the Jewish Tanakh, except that he includes the book of Baruch while excluding the book of Esther, but says that Esther is still a beneficial book to any believer along with the Wisdom of Solomon, Syriac, Judith, Tobit, the Teaching of the Apostles, also known as the Didache, and the Shepherd of Hermes. And, of course, the same list of the 27 New Testament books that we have today. His whole point was to make clear what is accepted as scripture and what is not. It was never as if he was the judge and jury of what got in and what got kicked out. Now, for our purpose here, is that his work on the Incarnation is where we find his 70 weeks view. This comes in chapter 6, where he's basically geared at trying to refute the Jews who rejected Jesus as the Messiah. He said, But they shall be refuted on this supreme point more clearly than any other. And that not by ourselves, but by the most wise Daniel, for he signifies the actual date of the Savior's coming, as well as his divine sojourn in our midst. Seventy weeks, he says, are cut, upon, cut short upon thy people and upon thy holy city to make it complete end of sin and for sins to be sealed up and iniquities blotted out and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to seal vision and profit and to anoint a holy one of holies. So we have his verse 24 here and you can see that Athanasius has made point six clearly pointing to a person rather than potentially the temple. He continues on. And thou shalt know and understand from the going forth of the word to answer and to build Jerusalem unto Christ the Prince. And this is actually where Athanasius stops expositing on Daniel 9. So, he only quoted half of verse 25 and doesn't bring up verse 26 or 27 at all. So basically, this is his whole system. There are no dates, although he said the actual date is spelt out for the Messiah's coming as well as his sojourn on earth, which likely makes a person wonder, how can he think that this refutes non-believing Jews? Well, here's his rationale. In regard to the other prophecies, they may possibly be able to find excuses for deferring their reference to a future time. But what can they say to this one? How can they face it at all? Not only does it expressly mention the anointed one, that is, the Christ, it even declares that he who is to be anointed is not man only, but the Holy One of Holies. And it says that Jerusalem is to stand till his coming, and that after it, prophet and vision shall cease in Israel. So, his proof is that the Mashiach Nagid and the Kadesh Kadesh are referring to the Messiah and that his arrival had to come during a time where Jerusalem was still around. So, the Messiah's coming had to have happened prior to the 70 AD destruction. Athanasius doesn't have a full-blown system here, but basically he is presenting his case as a matter of logic. 
what this is predicated upon is the defining of the Mashiach Nagid as the King Messiah. Another point that Ath Athanasius brings up is the absence of new prophets in the land. What he is basically trying to say here is, hey, look, Jerusalem, the whole Judean territory, and your people have been repeatedly defeated in all the attempted revolts against the Romans. So first, there's not even a place for the Messiah to show up any longer in. And second, where are any of your new prophets of yours lately? Because it's been nearly 800 years since Malachi that God has risen one up in your eyes. Now, that is actually a good point for us to bring up when talking with a non-believing Jew, because we can still press them on this same point today. Because God sent numerous prophets preaching mainly repentance for centuries, then essentially shut off the valve after Malachi in their viewpoint. But, come the first century, there's all of a sudden an explosion of a messianic expectation on the part of the Jewish people that fueled much of the three failed revolts. Even critics will say the same thing, but usually in their attempt to try to undermine the Christian viewpoint by saying something like, there were so many so-called messiahs walking around during that time, so the whole Jesus movement was nothing unique to its time. But what this really does is beg the question of, why were the Jews expecting the arrival of the Messiah then? It's as if they had something, or some book in mind, that was pointing them to this specific period in time. Just try to let that simmer for a while, because we will be coming back to that point in future videos. So, although Athanasius doesn't provide a full system, is that his historical point about the absence of prophets is beneficial to us when we share why Jesus is the messianic prophet that Moses said would come to the Jews. We can't say that Athanasius had a whole system unto himself there, but we know from there and some other parts of his writings that the 70 weeks and all six points were fulfilled with Jesus in his viewpoint. Next up, Cyril of Jerusalem. Cyril was one of the main theologians of his time. We'll be checking out his 12th lecture that brings up the 70 weeks. He says, But we seek still more clearly the proof of the time of his coming. For man being hard to persuade, unless he gets the very years for a clear calculation, does not believe what is stated. What then is the season, and what the manner of the time? It is when, on the failure of the kings descended from Judah, Herod, a foreigner, succeeds to the kingdom. So, he's got Herod the Great part of his scheme working here. He continues, The angel, therefore, who converses with Daniel says, And do thou now mark the words. So, Cyril then quotes 925, but he doesn't quote the very last clause about how the people rebuilding the temple will experience persecution and resistance. Why I point things out like this is that I think you're starting to catch on that if an author doesn't mention some part of a verse, is that it was likely intentionally done. So, let's see if this omission was purposeful or not on the part of Cyril. He goes on. Now, three score and nine weeks of years contain 483 years. Gabriel said, therefore, that after the building of Jerusalem, 483 years having passed, and the rulers having failed, then cometh a certain king of another race, in whose time the Christ is to be born. Did you catch the impact on his earlier omission? By omitting the part about the rebuilders enduring hardship, that was Cyril was then able to claim that the starting point happened after Jerusalem's reconstruction was completed. This also avoids the, the fact that the starting point is clearly connected to a commandment or decree that is issued to green light its rebuilding. So basically, he only wants to use the middle piece of verse 25 to prove his system and that it was predicting the birth of the Messiah. Cyril places the starting point as Darius the Medes' sixth year in the first year of the 66th Olympiad. 
If this sounds familiar, it's because of what we saw earlier with Eusebius. But he said it was the second year of Darius and not the sixth by referring to the multiple Old Testament passages about the re construction resuming in the second year. But Cyril said the sixth year. And the reason why is because he was going off of Ezra 6.15 that said that the second temple's construction was finished in the sixth year of Darius and just like Eusebius equated Darius the Mede with Darius the Great and extends from there to Herod the Great in the 186th Olympiad. This again dates the 69 weeks end point well before Jesus' birth. And even though Cyril said that this was a proof, was that I suspected that he doubted this system as he knew there were other competing systems out there. Well, that's the closest we come so far to a match. Next up, Julius Hilarianus. He wrote towards the very end of the 4th century. His main work that we'll be diving into is his Chronology of the World. And since we only have a Latin version available to us today, is that Google will once again be our translator. His 70-week system covers about a fourth of his work. But before we dive into his system, is that he totaled 5,530 5, years, say it that way better, from creation to the crucifixion occurring in the 16th year of Tiberius. Then adds to this saying, as to the conclusion of 6,000 years due to the year 470. So we've encountered another creation week model of history proponent. With his placement of the crucifixion in the 16th year of Tiberius, is that we can assume that he would have the birth in the year 5500 that mirrors many of our previous covered writers. He says at the year 6000 that, rounding up and killing the Antichrist, the amount of 6000 years becomes a resurrection of all the world was still alive. Running streams of even a thousand years in which the dragon, that old, the devil, and Satan is confined in the deep for him. So, we see that he is a chillist, believing that there will be a millennial kingdom following the Antichrist's destruction. After this, he says, After the seventh millennium year, and the year loosed out of his prison, and will go out to deceive the nations Gog and Magog, and when Satan has gathered them to the camp of the saints, as it were, to the battle. And the fire will come down from heaven, and all towards all men, and then there will be a second resurrection of all flesh. And on behalf of the righteous judgment of God, and they will be judged for not believing all of, but only in themselves, had no pleasure in works of righteousness. And after that, the sky and the land, the city is described in Revelation 21, is ready to descend from the heaven of wealth in which just live, and it will be a new heaven and a new earth, and they both remain in perpetuality, but the burns eternal, and just as God in heaven. Amen. So, he understands the book of Revelation to be chronologically laid out linearly and literally. With this type of reading is that it creates two separate resurrection events taking place. To rabbit trail here just for a moment is that taking a linear view of Revelation is that you will typically have this type of outline. Then come Revelation 20 verses 4 through 5 you read, They, the martyrs, lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So. You can see that the mourners were resurrected, but the unrighteous weren't resurrected until the thousand year reign was completed. Then in verse 12, you see the dead are now standing before God after the thousand years. This is how Julius and others, other commentators come away with two separate resurrection events taking place. 
where this comes into play in our study is that the Apostle John is pulling from Daniel 12, 1 through 2 that says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. You can see the resurrection language here with the dead awakening and being judged. The tracking here is the Septuagint translation that uses the word exagaro that is etymologically rooted from agaro. We see Paul using both of these words describing Jesus' resurrection and ours that will take place. The word used in the New Testament for resurrection is anastasis. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, uses this and agaro together, thus linking all three words together that can speak of the general resurrection event spoken about in taking place from Daniel 12. In John 5.21, Jesus said, For as the Father raise, raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth him whom he will. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So you can see both words being used together with Jesus alluding to Daniel 12 too. Now back to Julius. Now you might be expecting here is that he is naturally going to place the 70 weeks ending at the year 6000 like Hippolytus and Apollinarius did. And that expectation is actually wrong. He actually has them ending with Antiochus. Yes, we've now encountered our first Christian author who doesn't interpret the 70 weeks messianically. Heretic! Now, before everyone goes throwing Julius under the bus for this, he has to first realize this doesn't necessarily mean that Julius took a late authorship view of the book. You just saw that he is clearly a supernaturalist and was trying to calculate slash predict Jesus' second coming. So the important question to ask here is, why did he place it there? But let's see his explanation because it's likely going to prep us well when starting to encounter critical views. Keep in mind, we are still working with Google Translate and some of the wording is going to get a little rough here. Julius dated Nebuchadnezzar's destruction in the year 4814 from creation. So, we can plot this on his timeline. Before moving on, notice that there is 716 years between Nebuchadnezzar's destruction and Christ's passion on his timeline. This would put the first temple's destruction in 689 BC. This is over a hundred years earlier than modern reckoning, and Julius had plenty of earlier historians to get a better approximation for his dates, so this is really eyebrow raiser number one. Next, he said that the year the, the 70 year exile began after Jerusalem's destruction, which we know is wrong because there were already two prior deportations that included Daniel. Iroh of Razor number two. He then says that we come upon the 70 weeks of Daniel. Here he says, the 70 weeks are cut out on your people and in the city, even Jerusalem. And you stop and consider the result holy, whether it answer the city and to build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, that is 49 years. So, he has covered the first seven weeks, ending with the Mashiach Nagi. He continues on. For the first year of Darius the king, and he ruled in the kingdom of the Chaldeans, who slew the king too, 
and Bel Belteshazzar. Daniel saw the vision in the 21st year of the captivity of Jerusalem. Now, does anything from Daniel 9, 1, and 2 say anything about it being the 21st year of captivity? No. And Julius doubles down on this by saying that it was 18 years after Zedekiah plus three more years of Belshazzar. How he got to this was likely by subtracting 49 years from the 70 years of captivity, leaving 21 years. That was his justification for saying it was the 21st year of the captivity, even though we saw that it is completely contrary to what Daniel wrote in chapter 1. So, we can now add this into his chronology system. He goes on by saying that the anointing of the Holy of Holies took place then as the Zerubbabel the Mashiach Nagid, who came at the end of the first seven weeks, and he even calls Zerubbabel king. The note here is that Zerubbabel was only ever called governor because Israel was still under Persian jurisdiction. And after this, he says, comes the next 62 weeks, i.e. 434 years, that is basically the longest city rebuilding project known to man. And I do say that sarcastically for a reason, as we'll discuss later on. Then, in the 141st year of the Greek Empire, that he says Antiochus came to the helm that finishes out the 70th week. So, we have finished out his 70 weeks system, which looks close to the actual time period of Antiochus' persecution. But, again, he is cheating recorded history because 1st Maccabees doesn't record anything about the 141st year. It does say that the Jews cleansed the temple in the 148th year, so maybe all that Julius was doing here was subtracting seven years to get back to the 141st. And if you do that, then you can portray it as though the abomination of desolation took place in the midst of the final week, thus finishing the 70 weeks in the 2nd BC. I hope you see how all this is kind of prep for us when dealing with the critics. They do similar things to arrive at these dates, and also I need to remind you is that 1st Maccabees dates the years from the start of the Seleucid Empire around 312 BC, not from Alexander's conquest if you're trying to keep up with all the chronology stuff here. Now, where you just have to start laughing at all this with Julius is him saying that the Persians ruled for 263 years, and when you get to the 141st year of the Greeks, is that this equals to 62 weeks. But all you have to do is add up the numbers, and he's short by 30 years. And this isn't the first time Julius can't add up his own numbers properly either. Just go back to the beginning, you'll see him just totally botching it just with the Genesis numbers. But remember, there is a why to all of his madness here. He goes on saying that in the 174th year of the Greek Empire, that Lucius was a Roman consul and basically told the Mediterranean to back off Judea. You can read about this in 1 Maccabees 15. But the Lucius here is not the Lucius that Julius was referring to because that one was a Roman consul in 151 BC. It's more likely the Lucius that is in 1st Maccabees was Roman Council Calvus, who was council in 142 BC. But there's a reason why Julius made this swap. No differently, though, than we've seen other authors change which Darius they were referring to. Because he says, From the councilship for the full years of this, for they are the councils of the year that seek after found to the Passion of Christ until the 16th year of Tiberius, 179 years were completed. So, he initially went forward by 26 years. This would approximately land you around 142 BC that matches Lucius Calvus as Roman Council. But, this leaves only 170 years between this and the cross, 
and he wants 179. So he swapped the two to make up the nine year difference. And the whole reason why Julius was doing all this was because, and therefore the device to Christ's suffering is 5,530 years. As to the conclusion of 6,000 years is due 474, 470 more years. For Jewish people, the figure we all supports the settling of their ages. Therefore, the passion of the Christ, after which time the faith of believers in the resurrection promised by God's Son, must be completed 470 years to conclude of 6,000 years. That's right. His whole mission was to construct a chronology where he landed at 5,530 for the crucifixion, by which he could then predict the second coming on the 6,000th year from creation. So his whole 70-week system was designed to get this end result. Now the reason why I drilled down on Julius was to show you that he was clearly cheating scripture and history in order to make his system work. So if any critic tries to appeal to him as proof that early Christians did see the 70 weeks speaking about Antiochus, is that you now know that he, the reason why he planted there to begin with, so you can just brush their appeal to him just right off your back. And just for knowledge's sake, is that he did some earlier things right from the beginning to get Jerusalem's destruction in the year 4814, but you can check that out for yourself if you like. Next up, Sepulsius Severus. He is another chronographer from this time period. Although he says the world was created nearly 6,000 years ago, is that he acknowledges that few chronographers agree with one another in their calculations. The good thing for us is that he is not aiming to calculate the 6,000th year to predict the end of the world. So, we can just move forward to his treatment of Daniel. He addresses Daniel's, Daniel 2's vision of the statue by saying that the uncut stone prefigures Christ and that he will establish a future kingdom for believers. He starts his exposition of the 70 weeks by saying, There exists and also a record of visions of Daniel in which he revealed the order of events in coming ages, embracing in them also the number of the years within which he announced that Christ would ascend, descend to earth as has taken place and clearly set forth the future coming of Antichrist. If anyone is eager to inquire into these points, he will find them more fully treated of in the book of Daniel. Our design is simply to present a connected statement of events. The two takeaways here is that Severus is interpreting the weeks messianically and very likely seen the Antichrist in verse 27. What I like about Severus is that he wants to give us his view in a straightforward manner. He continues on. But the completion of the restored city is related to have been affected in the 32nd year of the reign of Artaxerxes. From that time to the crucifixion of Christ, that is, to the time when Hufius Genimus and Rubellus were councils, there elapsed 398 years. We get his initial time markers here. The 32nd year of Artaxerxes is referenced in Nehemiah 5.14 and 13.6. The first has Nehemiah referencing his 12 years as governor after building of the city's walls. Severus's thinking here is likely that the restoration of the city lasted until the 32nd year. And the other reference comes right at the end of the book of Nehemiah with him requesting to go back to Jerusalem because a couple of yahoos were being corrupt in the temple. From here, Severus says that there are 398 years to Christ's crucifixion when Genimus and Rubellus were Roman councils together. The knowledge nugget here is that two people were annually appointed as Roman councils. They held the most power while Rome was a republic, but even when you get into the empire period, 
is that these positions were still held and appointed. Now the fact that they came in pairs and were appointed annually is that if events are tagged to a given pair is that knowing the specific year in which that event took place can be easily deduced. And for Severus, he sinks the crucifixion in 29 AD, which would be Tiberius's 15th year, like mentioned in Luke, if you start counting from 14 AD. So, if you start with 29 AD and rewind back 398 years, is that you get 370 BC. What this means is that Severus places the events of Nehemiah during the time period of Artaxerxes II and not Longinimus like everyone else does. And you can see that Artaxerxes II, 32nd year, does land pretty close to 370 BC. Does this cause a lot of scriptural issues within Ezra and Nehemiah? Yes, it does, but we're not going to get into those. He goes on saying, But from the restoration of the temple to its destruction, which was completed by Titus under Vespasian, when Augustus was consul, there was a period of 483 years. That was formally predicted by Daniel, who announced that from the restoration of the temple to its overthrow, there would elapse 70 and 9 weeks. Why does Severus say 79 weeks rather than 69? I'm not sure, but he has the right amount of years, so it's not a pressing point for us. And here, he says that the 483 years finishes with the 70 AD destruction. That would then place its initial restoration around 414 BC. That would then make Darius Nathus the Darius from Ezra 6, who in his sixth year, the temple's restoration is said to be completed. Nathus' sixth year is pretty close to 414 BC. And we know that these are the two Persian kings that he was imagining because he finishes saying, Now, from the date of the captivity of the Jews until the restoration of the city, there were 260 years. So, to connect his dots correctly is that he is working back from the restoration of the city in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes II, not the temple, and by doing this, it lands you around 630 BC, which is 25 years earlier than the first deportation by modern reckoning. How he might have arrived at this was that if you look at Cyrus's very first year as king of Persia in 559, is that by adding 70 years of Babylonian captivity to this, is that would land you around 630 BC. So you can see the possible thinking of Severus here, which only then leaves us with what did he do with the 70th week? This he implicitly addressed at the beginning by saying the future coming of the Antichrist that would link, be linked to the 70th week to Jesus' second coming when he establishes the everlasting kingdom for believers. But before this, the Antichrist will persecute the saints to a high level in his view. And I think that part of his reasoning for a future Antichrist figure is that he dates the composition of the book of Revelation after the 70 AD destruction during Domitian's reign. A person's belief on when the book of Revelation was composed usually goes hand in hand with their 70 weeks view. So, Severus's system includes a large interval of time between the end of the 69th week and the start of the 70th. Are we still batting 100% for differing views here? Uh, regardless, we're almost to the finish line at this point. Next up, Augustine. The man doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. Now, the only glimpse we get of his view on the 70 weeks is found in his 199th correspondent letter, replying on the topic of the end of the world. There he said, 
All of the prophecy of the 70 weeks was fulfilled at Christ's first advent. Therefore, it is not to be expected that the events will occur again at the second advent. With him, Eusebius and Athanasius, all saying that the 70 weeks concluded with Jesus, is that you can imagine how much weight this carried in the church for centuries to come. And last on our list is Jerome. He spent over 20 years developing the Latin Vulgate. Aside from this, he also wrote a large number of commentaries, including one on Daniel that is largely geared at refuting periphery, the hero of the modern day critic. Jerome wrote, Periphery wrote his 12th book against the prophecy of Daniel, denying that it was composed by the person to whom it is ascribed in its title but rather by some individual living in Judea at the time of Antiochus who was surnamed Epiphanes. Periphery furthermore alleged that Daniel did not foretell the future so much as he related the past. And lastly that whatever he spoke of up till the time of Antiochus did contain authentic history, whereas anything he may have conjectured beyond that point was false inasmuch as he would not have foreknown the future. The same arguments that we're still dealing with today. Jerome then continues on saying that none of the prophets has so clearly spoken concerning Christ as has this prophet Daniel. But also he set forth the very time at which he would come and stated the actual number of years involved and announced beforehand the clearest signs of the events to come. And because periphery saw that all these things had been fulfilled and could not deny that they had taken place, he overcame this evidence of historical accuracy by taking refuge in this evasion, contending that whatever is foretold concerning Antichrist at the end of the world was actually fulfilled in the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes because of certain similarities to things which took place at his time. The thing to highlight here is Jerome's comment about the Antichrist being present at the end of the world. Now, moving out of his prologue and into his 70 weeks commentary is that we start with his very own translation of verses 24 through 27. Looking at verse 24 is that we can see that his point six is clearly describing the Messiah. Then in verses 25 through 26 a, is that you can see that he is seeing one Mashiach in the prophecy. Remember that some can see two in the prophecy, with the first one being Zerubbabel or Joshua the high priest, and the second being Jesus. Now, the way Jerome finishes translating verse 26 is that he is clearly distinguishing the leader that shall come from Jesus in the first part of the verse. This then carries into verse 27 that the he there is speaking of the leader that shall come and not the Messiah. Jerome now comments saying, Because the prophet had said, Thou didst lead forth thy people, and thy name was pronounced upon thy city and upon thy people. Gabriel therefore, as the mouthpiece of God, says by implication, by no means are they God's people, but only thy people. Nor is Jerusalem the holy city of God, but is only a holy city unto thee, and thou sayest. So, basically Jerome is saying that this prophecy is for the Jewish people alone, but with the added statement that they are not God's people. He backs up this interpretation by referencing Exodus 32 when God told Moses to go back down the mountain because Moses' people are worshiping the golden calf. This argument is still used today by some Christian commenta commentators to namely draw a dividing line between national or ethnic Israel and what they would call the true or spiritual Israel, i.e. the church. For Jerome, though, this is the end of his expositing on the 70 weeks, as he says the following. Now, I realize that this question has been argued over in various ways by men of greatest learning, 
and that each of them has expressed his own views according to the capacity of his own genius. And so, because it is unsafe to pass judgment upon the opinions of the great teachers of the church and to set one above another, I shall simply repeat the view of each and leave it to the reader's judgment as to whose explanation ought to be followed. From this, he describes and cites seven Christian views and the view of the Hebrews. The last one will be discussed in our upcoming video on Jewish interpretations of the 70 weeks. So, as far as constructing Jerome's 70 week system is the following. Now, did he see the Messiah's death right at the end of the 62nd week period, or simply that it would happen after their completion? Mm, can't say for sure. But, in regards to his 70th week view, I think we can say that he is a futurist in those regards because we noted earlier his comment on predicting the Antichrist presence at the end of the world and that he was drawing upon verses 26 through 27 for this. And if you were to flip back to his chapter 2 commentary is that he takes the fourth empire with Rome and finishes saying, But its feet and toes are partly of iron and partly of earthenware, a fact most clearly demonstrated at the present time. So it's possible that Jerome sided with others believing that the end of the world was near during his time period. He develops more on this idea in his chapter 7 commentary by equating the fourth beast with the Romans and adds that, all the kingdoms at once are to be destroyed because of the blasphemy of the Antichrist. And the succeeding empire shall not be an earthly empire at all, but it is simply the abode of the saints, where, which is spoken of here at, and the advent of the conquering of the Son of God. Moving ahead to his 725 commentary, speaking on the three and a half year persecution of the Antichrist, is that Jerome continues saying on this, During this period the saints are to be given over to the power of the Antichrist, in order that those Jews might be condemned who did not believe the truth but supported a lie. Jesus also spoke of this period in the Gospel, saying, Unless those days have been cut short, no flesh would be saved. The connector here for us is that Jerome cites Matthew 24, 22. And that should be ringing a bell in our heads because this is from the Olivet Discourse where Jesus, Jesus prophesies on the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And because of these additional comments is that it's evident that Jerome envisioned a parentheses of time between the 69th week and the final 70th week that would occur at the eschatological endpoint in the near future. So in conclusion, is that even when we come to the fourth century, is that we have seen there is no such thing as a consensus view on how to interpret the 70 weeks. So when you come across any commentator or so-called prophecy expert that tries to paint as if the early church writers agree with their view, is that you know it's coming from a biased perspective that is not going to tell you the specifics as to how those writers even arrived at their viewpoint because they need to make people think that they got it all figured out and if their readers knew that their sources cheated the text and even history for that matter is that their credibility would go out the window. Reminder, hit the subscribe button, turn on the notification bell, hit the like button, leave a comment, and don't forget to visit us at justscripture.org. But in the meantime, stay salty.